So uh, a reminder that we're looking at the benefits of AI and what is on the horizon. And I'll just introduce our four panelists um, who are going to talk for five minutes each about this topic. Um, and then we will open it up for questions and we can have a good, um, rich conversation uh, between us. Um, so first of all, we have Michael Webb, who's Director of Technology and Analytics at GIST. Then we have Christine Stone, uh, Senior Director of Strategy and Innovation at Clarivate. Ashley Faith, who's Director of AI and Semantic Innovation at EBSCO. And Thomas Badilla, who's Deputy Director, Archiving and Data Services at the Internet Archive. Uh, and so we're gonna start with Michael, um, who's going to kick us off uh, with his thoughts on the answer to this question. Over to you, Michael. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'll just say a little bit about myself, first of all, and, and what I do. I head up JISC's AI team. We formed the team about um, three years ago now to help universities and colleges um, adopt AI in a, a responsible way. And it's been an interesting journey. Um, we spent probably the first um, year and a half trying to get people interested in AI. Then ChatGPT got released and we suddenly become very popular and people wanted to talk to us, which was nice. Um, but it, it's created quite an interesting journey. Um, I think one of the starting points for the, the question here is um, AI has been one of the few things that we've um, that I've seen, certainly, that has touched on all parts of an institution. And it's been quite fascinating for us um, talking to um, administrators, educators, technical staff, um, all sorts of people about AI. And I think I want to start by looking at perhaps the most universal um, thing that I think perhaps libraries should start doing or are probably are doing at the moment to start leveraging it. Um, look a little bit then at, at students and then just a little bit of horizon scanning. So I think the universal starting point at the moment is how AI can increase personal productivity and automate the tasks that perhaps um, we'd rather not do um, so that we can get on and do those where we add most value. We're already seeing um, real evidence that AI um, can increase personal productivity. We've been piloting an AI tool, Teachomatic, in um, about eight colleges to about 500 staff. And we're seeing an average time saving there of about um, two, three hours a week, Some much more for some people. So the Talk about personal productivity, we think very much is real. Mm -hmm. It's get geared up, think about how you're gonna get staff started. And then we're saying across the board, now's the time to think about what are the things that are taking your time? Which of those do you value as human activities and which you're opening to automating? Don't worry about whether they're automatable at the moment, the technology is moving fast, but now's the time to start thinking about what you want to automate. The next area I want to touch on is um, students and what they're saying. So we've done a lot of um, panels with students. My colleague Sue has traveled around the country, first of all, last um, spring, um, and then just for Christmas to get a view for what students were doing, what they're asking for. Um, and by and large, we find that students are using um, AI in increasingly sophisticated ways, but they want a lot more guidance on how to use it within their studies. And um, libraries obviously are ideally situated to um, help and provide that. And I know plenty are doing lots of great work in that space. Um, and then just want to end with a little bit, it's not, I think the horizon's quite hard to see at the moment, but um, I think one of the things that is worth thinking about in all areas, of, of what are the fundamental aspects of, of what you do um, being affect, that AI is affecting? So, for example, in, um, in academic disciplines, it's about how is the um, job that the student might want to change um, changing will it exist i think one of the things that i find really interesting perhaps in the library space is how the nature of reading and writing is changing and how it's going to change over the next few years 
a lot of the discussion has been around writing and students um, using AI for their um, coursework and so on. And I think perhaps not quite enough on how the nature of um, reading is changing. But we've been in a situation where for a very long time, um, you've had very little control over um, the, the way material you read is presented. AI is changing that. Um, any document that I want to read, engage with, I can summarize, shorten, change the tone, present it in a way that that's more meaningful for me. And I think that's only going to increase. And I think we need to think about how the information we provide is going to be consumed in that kind of landscape. So I think those are the areas that I'd perhaps um, kick off. I think I haven't quite used my full five minutes, but that's absolutely fine. So I'll hand over to our next um, panellist. Thanks, Michael. You were actually dead on five minutes, so that was absolutely perfect. And we're just moving on to Christine next. Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, super. Okay, uh, hello everyone. Um, yeah, maybe just um, something about myself first. Um, I'm part of a relatively new team at Claribate um, that's called Academic AI Platform Team. And, and it really means in, in practice that I'm working on, on projects um, using generative AI for various um, things in, in, in our platforms. Um, I think it's worth mentioning that AI is, is really not that new. I mean, many of us have used um, AI for, especially for machine learning for very specific tasks. But what is really new is um, now the use of large language models. And, and we tend to kind of throw this into one pot, um, but it's really something um, which is going beyond the, the, the normal use of AI. Let's call it the normal use of AI. And since I'm very involved with generative AI, I'm going to focus um, on, on that in, in my points. Um, so generative AI is, is really about um, being able to create new content, new text, making it also contextual. It's really good with accelerating and, and supporting things like productivity, um, like Michael already mentioned, and, and innovation. Um, but of course, there are also concerns that we need to discuss um, what impact does this have on things like research integrity, education integrity. Um, you know, we heard here talks about hallucinations um, or bias and that sort of thing. Um, so it's important to look at how we want to use large language model and generative AI. Um, there's also a lot of talk about the responsible and ethical use of them. And I think this needs very careful definition. Um, it, it's not enough to say, oh, I'm using it ethically. What does it actually mean? And I think this is a task for the community really, rather than one stakeholder. Um, we've just, just started uh, what we call an AI advisory council. Um, that's one discussion group to help with um, de definitions, guardrails and that sort of thing. But of course there needs need to be discussions at, at different places. Um, I know that NISO is having some discussions around that the standards organization. Um, so that's really something that is very important. Um, if we're looking at um, areas where large language models can have significant impact, I think the key word is efficiency. And Michael already talked about product productivity, efficiency, um, focusing on the things that you really want to do and have AI or generative AI do the rest, so to speak. Um, so that can be on the front end for library patrons, but it can also be on the back end for librarians. Um, I think for library patrons, the goal is really to make it intuitive and fast to find material, and that is trustworthy material, not the citations that are being made up by ChatGPT. Um, and key features that we can support, for example, in our products with large language models are semantic search. You know, you, you search across um, a, a lot of different material um, in natural language. Um, but as Michael mentioned already, uh, also providing an overview of how the material in the library is answering a research question. We can, for example, extract key aspects, overviews, um, and, and also make this contextual to the, to the, users, um, to the user's question or context. Um, and that's really also about glanceability and efficiency for the library users. Um, I think one of the things that also we need to discuss here and you know, maybe not in, in detail or we need to mention here is also how we do this because obviously we're using pre-trained large language models. They're coming with some issues, um, but we want answers that we're giving or information that we're giving to users to be based on our content. And um, we're using um, retrieval augmented generation. And I know that many other companies and institutions are also using the same architecture, which is really making this um, very efficient. Um, on the back end, um, AI tools can also provide more efficiency in a variety of area. Um, I would like to mention two 
One is um, automatic metadata creation. For example, um, you know, you, you're missing some metadata, you want to enrich your records, you're missing, for example, an ebook records language information. That's something that we found in, in, in some of the, the metadata records that we have, specifically ebooks. Um, this is quite easy to extract that and enrich the metadata. Or you can create the metadata from scratch. For example, you could um, load an image of a book jacket and it will extract automatically the basic metadata. One of the things I would say here, though, is um, you have to have the human at the beginning and the end of the process. So human in the loop is a very important context con con concept when it comes to using generative AI for, for any of those tasks. Um, another use case is analytics and collection management to automatically get um, reports and insights. Um, we call this also conversational analytics. You ask a question, you get your information, you get your insights, and you can make your decisions based on those insights. So again, large language models in AI can, can really contribute here to more efficiency. Um, and the last point I want to raise is the question of Gen AI literacy. And that's also something that I find personally really super important. I think this is just essential for all of us. Um, and also going back to the responsible application of large language models, um, sooner or later, we are all using Gen AI in our jobs in one way or another. And it's just really important to, to understand the basics here. And as I mentioned before, I think human expertise in the human in the loop is still really essential, but it also means that you have to understand um, what you're doing here and how you can use Gen AI, or where, also where the boundaries are. Okay, and that's all I wanted to say initially, and I'm passing this on to the next panelist. Thanks, Christine. Uh, the next panelist is Ashley. Hello, I'm so happy to, to be here talking to, to all of you today. So um, I know I, we already had introductions, but um, more on, on my background, I am, am a librarian by trade. I've been doing library science with machine learning and semantics. So that's more like linked data and knowledge graphs for over 15 years. I was doing this, I remember in my, my dissertation, uh, I was talking about these topics and my advisory board at University of Pittsburgh Library School was like, I don't, this is not classification. What is this? This is not cataloging. I'm like, no, it's not. <laughs> it's this new thing. Um, and here we are today talking more about it, which is, which is fabulous because there's a lot of promise, but then there's a lot of things that kind of make us nervous. And so what I do here at EBSCO is I am leading up all the teams that are focusing on both AI and semantics. So that would be linked data and knowledge graphs. And the reason we do both of those is I know we've mentioned a few times here, you know, there's that that trust factor that's kind of missing from the, narr the AI narrative. And there's hallucinations, but there's also where did that data come from? Is it trustworthy? Just because it's correct doesn't mean I'm going to trust the source that it comes from because then I can't use it in my research, right? I need a citation for some of these things. So not only are we using RAG uh, retrieval that is getting augmented by a source of truth, normally folks can use full text for that. But at EBSCO, we actually have had for over 14 years this really great resource called the Unified Subject Index. It's all of the rich metadata that we have on all the content created in a graph form. So what does that do? It actually gives us a source of truth, not just, okay, it's from the full text, right? So the, the researchers thought that it was accurate, but we see redactions. We see research all the time disagreeing with one another. <laughs> does the thing cause cancer or does this thing help with cancer? Depends, it, depends on which researcher you're looking at. And so what we've done is we're actually building out this, this more resources into our knowledge graph to add in what's called graph rag, which is graph based um, retrieval augmentation to LLMs. And so the reason that we're doing that is there's research out there um, that you can you can look up um, that if you use graph specifically to help ground your AI, which that's what the LLMs are, larger language models, uh, you can reduce your hallucinations um, predicted by 48%. So, whoa, that's a whole lot, right? And um, other big companies that are already using the same practice, I think LinkedIn just came out saying that they too are using their big knowledge graph to do their, their augmented retrieval for AI, and they're seeing about a 31 to 34% decrease in hallucinations. So that's awesome. So a lot of the things that we're working on is we have these sources of truth 
We also have to corroborate those sources of truth, those, those, uh, uh, the things that, that are so authoritative in the research space, which is the research itself. But we have to make sure that those things also are, are being displayed in a way that you, you know is, is corroborated with other evidence. So, so that's one way that we're adding in some of that truthfulness or trustworthy factor into some of the AI. And, you know, this is part of the narrative, right? The, so I know everyone has talked about efficiencies and those are very important. But if I could say like the thing that we're building off of is trust. If you don't trust the data, if you don't trust the answer, if you don't trust the quality of your own library data, because we've all seen it, someone had a bad day and mistyped something, <laughs> or maybe the indexing has changed over the years. I've seen that quite a bit with older content that was identifying electric vehicles um, in the 1930s in magazine articles that was about an electric starter, not a real electric vehicle, right? So, so these are the things that I see AI really helping with is helping us look through all of that data that we have, standardizing it more, putting it into linked data resources that is a very librarian centric thing to then use that to give more trustworthy things out that is then assisted with AI. I see AI as just another tool. AI can be used as a good tool or a bad tool. And we all have to then do a lot of that uh, information and AI literacy to ourselves and, and our patrons to make sure that they know how to use it appropriately, what's okay, what's not okay. There's a lot of standards, a lot of regulations that are still de being developed on, can you use it to write your whole dissertation? Can you not? Probably not, but to what extent? All of these things are where the librarian, I'm so excited that librarians we have this great platform. We have been doing this stuff for generations. And now we can show the rest of the world that's struggling with these things. We got this. We've known how to figure out if this is trustworthy. How do you check your citations? How do you check that this is an authoritative source? We know how to do that. And so the rest of the world right, can learn a lot from us. And so I'm really excited that there's a lot of challenges, but librarian voices are so powerful in this space. And so like every time I have conversations like this, I'm always like, let's do this rallying cry, right? Like librarians, even if they don't really know all the AI stuff, we do know data and we do know information and we know how to make sure that you're doing that the right way. So that's that's my closing remark <laughs> before we jump into the other questions. Thanks, Ashley. Um, and we'll move on to Thomas. Great. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Thomas. I'm at the Internet Archive. So I have three things, as I was asked, uh, to share. I'm going to try and move through through those at a at a decent clip. Um, so the first one that I have, uh, I'll refer to as collections as data, sandbox, and global observatory. And you know this basically refers to the fact that for decades, libraries and their partners in, in publishing, for example, have dedicated significant resources to collection digitization. And over time, uh, that work also commingled with born digital collecting and knowledge production, which results in uh, quite a large cor corpus of library, archive, and museum collections as data um, prime for use cases where AI can help enhance our ability to meet our objectives as a community. Um, importantly, uh, in line with our values, uh, for an example of a value statement that may be useful for organizations that are thinking about um, uh, encouraging AI uses of their collections, uh, I was part of a project called Collections as Data Part to Whole, and we produced something called the Vancouver Statement on Collections as Data with representatives from about 16 or so different countries. I encourage you to take a look at that. Um, why sandbox and global observatory? Why that framing? Um, well, I think that for researchers and students that there's a certain scale of collections rendered as data that can serve as a sandbox for AI teaching purposes. And you know, beyond that, uh, when we get to a certain scale or um, a kind of uniqueness for the collections, that the collections themselves can constitute a kind of observatory where researchers can pursue groundbreaking research uh, truly uh, with our collections. I think that there's significant impact to be achieved at the multi-institutional collecting scale, um, and not a small challenge, uh, but in uniting decentralized uh, collection resources in order to create the most representative corpus possible. 
um, kind of akin to how a global observatory system collates uh, astronomical data around the world to create a picture of the cosmos. Kind of have a similar challenge at hand um, for making the most use of our collections. So that's collections as data, sandbox, and global observatory. The second one that I have, I refer to as evergreen information literacy role. Um, I think that for libraries and research libraries in particular, there's a particular position of strength from the work that we've been doing in uh, cultivating information literacy again for decades. Uh, certainly, we figured out how to continue to play an important role with the uh, widespread ubiquitous access to the internet. Um, should be the case that we can map that to AI as well. I think that it's all the more needed uh, given pervasive impacts that AI uh, is having on the information environment. Elections are very much uh, on our mind here in the United States. And then of course, data privacy more generally. In the late aughts, early 2010s, it was common uh, to start to refer to challenges and opportunities around big data by referring to uh, volume, velocity, and uh, variety, I believe. Um, perhaps with respect to AI, um, and I just made this up before this call, uh, you know, maybe we transition to consideration of evaluability, veracity, and authenticity, and see to what degree um, libraries can uh, you know, help with those aspects of AI evaluation. The last bit that I have as I'm kind of speeding along here is this idea of scaling library engineering capacity through open source AI. Um, for most of our organizations in the library community, even the research library community, um, we have comparatively limited uh, engineering capacity to support uh, knowledge infrastructure development. Um, I do believe that there are a number of um, AI uh, resources that can help uh, scale that limited engineering capacity uh, for greater impact. In talking with engineers at the Internet Archive, Sometimes they kind of uh, make an analogy that, you know, when they use some of these AI tools that they can move from a position of sort of like hammering nails all day to thinking more about carpentry and design. I do think that the use of truly open source AI is um, key. So as not to create undue sector dependency on a for-profit um, resource with little recourse, you know, kind of want to avoid the, what I refer to as the corn certification um, of our sector where all of a sudden AI is present in everything. And uh, while many of the tools are currently free, that is already changing as near lock-in is achieved in various aspects of our work. We want to avoid the mistakes of the past where we got locked into, say, content um, that you know doesn't is not aligned with uh, inflation, and it creates an undue financial burden um, on our community. That's all for me. I look forward to engaging with questions. Brilliant. Thank Thomas. Um... Uh, I think we're all coming back together again now. So if we can have all the panelists back together. Um, thank you so much for those very thought provoking reflections. Um, and you'll be pleased to hear that that's already generated questions in the chat. So we're away uh, with the queries. So um, we'll make the most of our time. So we'll get straight into them. Uh, so the first one um, from Victor, um, I agree that the approach, the approach for AI should be community orientated. Um, can you list uh, some examples of generative AI currently being used in, in both or either public and academic libraries. So I don't know who wants to. I, I can maybe start. I mean, there's one that I know a lot of folks are using and it has nothing to do with anyone on this call. <laughs> um, it's a search engine called Perplexity. A lot of people are, are looking at that because it is AI based. Um, I also know that there are tons of hallucinations on there and because students and well, humans are trained on Google and they trust what Google says, they think lots of other search engines are accurate, whatever they give you, which is not totally accurate. So that's another part of the information literacy that we have to start to teach people is some of the more, again, air quotes, trustworthy um, answers that maybe somebody would get from Google or other search engines are not as trustworthy anymore. Um, maybe to add, I think um, library users are already using a lot of Gen AI tools um, rather than actually the libraries. Um, you know, library users, and that's also what Ashley mentioned, perplexity, and there are, there are loads of other tools which are doing um, like summarization and you can upload PDFs and, and all that sort of thing. How, how legal that is, 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 is a different question, but it, this is what users are doing. Um, I'm not so familiar with what public libraries are doing. Um, in academic libraries, 
usually what I see is people are trying out things. I have not seen anything being in production, actually. It's like, you know, trying out, for example, to, um, to use this for a reference desk. Um, I had an example from someone who used this to, classif to classify queries that are coming into the reference desk to then redirect this to the right librarian. So, so interesting use case, up, you know, um, but I have not seen any other really tools in production. Yeah, a, a, a slight, not quite answering the question for me as well, but first of all, I've seen some fantastic work that libraries have done making information available to students about how to use generative AI. So that's a slightly different thing. The second is um, we are collating examples of um, good use of generative AI. The first wave of this will go live quite soon, and we focused on learning and teaching um, in the first instance. Um, we'd love, uh, once that's uh, available, to start collecting um, library examples. And we're after simple examples that uh, can be replicated as well as the more complex things. So um, that's a coming soon, hopefully, from us um, examples rather than telling you some today. Yeah, I would share um, just a couple of examples, and I'll put a link into the chat. Um, one that comes to mind is at the University of Calgary, which is a, a cross-campus collaboration between the library and a college to establish a student-focused center to promote AI, generative AI literacy. Um, that one is particularly interesting. I don't have a link, but I would also share that I was part of a forum um, a month or so ago where someone working in community archives in the United States referred to uh, community archives protocols. Um, and within those protocols, there was a, a protocol for refusing participation um, in, in uh, uh, ingesting community archive data uh, for generative AI purposes. So um, I guess two, one that is about supporting the use and then one is about sort of opposing the use or refusing to participate. Actually, I have, I have another example which just came to mind. Um, uh, the, the National Library of Luxembourg has a lot of digitized newspapers and they are using, um, I think, GPT 3.5 or one of the large language models to allow users to ask natural language questions um, in those newspaper articles. Super interesting. Um, you know, if you want to go there, I think you have to probably sign up as a Google user or something, but you can just use it. Um, you know, ask a natural language question about, for example, like a historic um, topic about Luxembourg. Um, and they're answering it based on the newspaper. So really interesting. Um, yeah, have a look. I would really encourage you. Actually, that, Christine, what you just said spurred, there is actually a lot of AI right now being used in the library archival and special collection space for digitizing things because it's improving OCR because it has better image recognition. Um, and it, it's also um, helping catalog those really strange, <laughs> right? Special collections, it's a unique piece of content. It doesn't exist anywhere else. So it's really hard to do copy cataloging on it. And so people are using it to clean the data, get better data from, you know, just regular images or the OCRs. Um, so it's not native full text, uh, meaning it's not in a machine readable format. Um, and that's really, really helpful because that stuff has been really hard to do. I mean, a lot of people uh, for a very long time have been trying to figure out how to make the digitization process much easier. I know that um, music scores is something a company called Docs, I think it's called Doxy AI is doing um, where they are helping to digitize music records. So there's some some of that that's going on where it's more about the digitization and, and creation and cleanup of the metadata. Right, thanks everyone. I think everyone's um, given examples there. What a great question to start with. Um, so thanks for that. Um, We'll move on to the next one, which is really around um, the environmental cost of LLMs um, uh, and the kind of uh, ethical use of that in the environmental context and how we make judgments really as libraries about how we contribute to the, the, the debate in a nuanced way uh, on the framing of questions around AI in this space. Maybe one, one direction to take um, is small language models. They take up less compute time. <laughs> so therefore it is better on the environment. Um, you know, it, it really boils down to the way that you as an individual or you as an institution is using AI, uh, again, depends on what you're doing with it. But 
traditionally speaking, a lot of the examples that this panel has talked about, those are not high compute. So that's when it has to like crunch everything down, figure it all out, the AI does. That's what takes all of that, that energy and the water resources and, and all of that. Um, so that is normally at the model level. So if somebody's creating their own uh, AI models or use, using some of the AI models that are out there, that's where the bulk of that environmental impact happens. The way you're using it likely is not as um, bad on the environment. What we've seen is like a typical search for semantic search or something uh, where you're generating insights. It costs no more in the environment than a typical search does. It's that that back end kind of environmental cost. And that's where transparency of models is so critical. There are leaderboards out there. Please be aware those are very rigged, so be careful. Stanford actually has a really good transparency index that I would highly recommend watching instead because that's really talking about how transparent is the model. Um, Hugging Face is going to be talking, I think, at some point. Ask them about that because they, they know about these things. Um, but yeah, that's part of the transparency is how much environmental impact does that model have, and that'll help you choose which model to go with. Um, I think generally speaking, I mean, I, I would I would agree that the large language models are the ones which are taking most of the computing power. Um, for a lot of the functionality, you do need large language models. That's just you know, this is not something that we can we can change. The question is, how are we going to deal with that in future? And I think this is again a community discussion. Um, I don't have a very good answer for that, but it's very clear that everything with big data that takes a lot of computing power is also um, not the best for the environment. I mean, it starts with the Google searches and it ends with the large language models. Um, and I think that's the general discussion. So I, I don't have a very good answer here. I think what Ashley said about transparency and informing yourself, um, you know, how, how what is going on, what is being used, um, moving to green energy is one of the things that uh, people are looking at, also companies are looking at, also the big companies are looking at, how successful is this going to be? Um, you know, I'm hopeful, but I don't have the answer. Yeah, I, so um, this is really complex, and I think that we could spend the entire hour um, on, on this subject. Um, so broadly, our approach is that this has to be part of AI literacy, environmental, human impact. Um, all of those things need to be things that we educate users so that they can make more informed decisions. Um, I think... It's much broader than just um, power consumption and water. There's the the entire supply chain of um, technology is incredibly complicated. It's very hard to unpick. Um, I agree completely that transparency is the key. It's actually incredibly hard to get accurate data about even energy consumption, about um, the uh, large language models, both querying and creation. Um, there's an awful lot of myths and misinformation and Chinese whispers that have turned estimates into facts. So I think this is a complex space. And um, I'd like us to work together to drill down and at least be able to present facts more accurately to people in the first instance. Um, <laughs> now I'll stop there because I could talk about this one for ages. Got plenty yeah, I'll more. just add a bit. I'll just add a bit. I've been doing the good librarian thing and just adding citations into the chat. Um, but, you know, one thing I would refer to is uh, Sasha Lucioni at Hugging Face has been quite focused in her role in the environmental impact of AI. Um, so I put a link out to a recent podcast that she did. And then there was also a recent Ars Technica piece, uh, investigative reporting that came out maybe yesterday, uh, which I also linked. Um, I do think that it's um, important for us as a community to, uh, of course, be like more literate with respect to this question, but um, also thinking about, you know, possible actions at the policy level through, through our associations. Um, I think that tends to be something that many of us are uh, less fluent in or have less experience in uh, with respect to advocacy at the policy level. But if we're to have real agency with respect to say environmental impact, um, you know, it, to me, it seems like a question of policy and law um, that may need to be done at say the RLUK level, but perhaps in collaboration with other say higher education sector writ large. 
Yeah, I agree. I think this is certainly from a JISC perspective, you know, we push hard every time we get a chance to on the transparency aspect. Right, thanks. I think we've had a few answers to that one. Again, um, a really good question. Um, uh, and thanks for the links as well in the chat, really helps people follow up, I think. Um, and some food for thought for the collaborations um, for us to take away. Um, we're not going to get to all of the questions, I think, in the time available. So I will say now, please keep the questions coming, because what we can do is um, iterate all of those questions with the panellists, if the panellists are willing, um, outside of the end of the session to make sure that everyone gets answers. Um, so we will um, we will look at that. Um, so in the spirit of sharing things out, Aftab, you've had one answered in the answers part. Um, so I'm going to move on to Nassim's question. Um, which is, does the panel think that guiding patrons to the right AI, AI tool for the right task is an important role for librarians to fill? Doesn't seem to be talked about much, um, but as AI applications become more specialised, it would appear to be increasingly relevant. Uh, and uh, you're uh, referencing your presentation on some work, Christine. So um, I don't know whether you want to take that one then first, Christine. Yeah, I can maybe just start. I think it's I, it's you know, it's it's an interesting question because there is a there is a task um, which is a little bit open now. Um, there are typically library library systems and and you know library databases, um, just resources that libraries provide, and if they're integrating generative AI, then it's, it's anyway the the library task really to. To, to guide their users. But what about tools that are outside the library that are used for you know, summarizing material, um, all sorts of tools that um, are using resources which are traditional library, traditionally library resources, but maybe they're doing it somewhere outside. I mean, would you add this to libguides? Would you add this to, to anywhere for your web pages? I think there is some expertise needed. There is some education needed and why not for the library to take at least some of that? Um, I would add though that the, the whole legal and copyright situation is adding some really, um, really some complexity here. Um, I'm, I'm certainly not an expert, but I know from a lot of discussions for my projects, because we are, you know, we're discussing every time I need to get clearance, can we use that material, can we not use material, it's really very, very complex. Um, you, you're taking something on there, especially if you, you know, talking about summarization of PDFs, articles, etc. When you, when you recommend tools, um, what, what do you tell the users? You need to know first how, how to use that, what is allowed, what is not allowed. There, there's just this, this whole aspect there, and that's very complicated. Yeah, there's um, there was a great panel at a conference earlier this year, uh, the Knowledge Graph Conference, where um, there were a lot of folks talking about this exact topic. And to mirror Christine's point, it's very complicated because you're not mining from content. That's not what you're doing. And there's a lot of standards and um, agreements in place on what you can do from a mining perspective from content. Also, there's a lot of different hands and a lot of different data, right? So you have a lot of different um, aggregators that are adding different variations of metadata to an article. Is that like, how does that play into all of this? Um, some of those are using subject authorities that may or may not be allowed to be used commercially. So Library of Congress uh, subject headings are, you know, can be used for a lot of different things. Um, but the German National Library, the GND, their version of authorities, some of that data can be used commercially, some cannot, right? So there's a lot of checks and balances that you have to do per data set. And that's why um, I, I think provenance and attribution is so critical to this whole conversation because whatever you are doing with whatever data, let's hope and 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 really stress that that has to be done ethically and responsibly so that you are allowed to use it under whatever copyright that is under. So moving from that, you still need to make sure that you know that you can track and verify that that information is being used appropriately according to the agreements that you have in place. And that's where attribution and provenance come from. If you're working with data, you don't know all the different actors that are are working with that along the whole pipeline. As as Michael had mentioned, it's a it's a complex pipeline. Um, making sure that you can track where all of that information is going, who's touching it, and all of that is important to make sure that you can honor whatever agreements that you do have in place. 
open access is a really funny and interesting case right now because there's such a push in the publishing space to make things open access. But now if it's on the open web, LLMs are being trained on the open web, a lot of the open web, I should say. Um, so that is now changing up that dialogue. And I haven't seen a lot of people talking about that. So I'm really interested to see where that conversation goes because there's the open science initiative and now that's all getting sucked up into the LLMs. <laughs> so is that okay? Is it not okay? I don't know if anyone has an answer to that, but it's it's something that I'm watching um, and adds into this, this whole dialogue. But the, the, the rule of thumb I always use is if you expect that this thing will show up on the open web, um, and you're okay with that, and there isn't any um, copyright that you're anticipating on it, it's probably okay to put it into an LLM. But if you do not own that content and you do not have any agreements in place, and that goes for individual students who probably don't know any better, which again, we get into you know the literacy piece here, um, they should not be putting content or even pieces of content, even the metadata of content into these AI tools because then that is likely going into the AI training and that's really not good. Yeah, I think it's quite it's quite interesting, actually, isn't it? So I think we're looking at Aptab's question as well here. So two questions together, which is cool. So I'm going to go back from start with that one, if that's OK, and then go back to the tools one. Um, so I'm not a licensing expert at all. I just want to sh share the GISC perspective and I'll just put a um, link to an article from our licensing team on on there. Um, but essentially, this is this is our advice that we put out um, a week or so ago, I think, on licensing clauses. And we're basically urging everyone to resist um, clauses that people are putting in that attempt to say that you can't use it for things that are legitimate AI stuff. And we think that, you know, collectively we need to do that. Um, I agree that, you know, that... Um, there are particular things about making sure it's not part of the training model, but that's actually can be sorted by user education. You know, generally users have got control over that now. Um, and that links us back to the tools, I think. And so the straight answer to that one is, yes, I really think that libraries should help students use the right tool for the right job. And um, an example here is that you can use the right tool that you guarantee doesn't use the data for training of the models, for example. These are all the sorts of great things that, that libraries can do. So yeah, absolutely, yes to the initial question. Anyone else want to come in or shall we move on? Maybe we'll move on. Great questions. Um, next, we've got a couple of quite specific questions um, from Duncan for um, two of the panelists. So what I suggest actually, because they're quite specific, is maybe we take those ones away and Ashley and Christine can answer those specifically. Um, and maybe for the discussion, move on to Johanna's question, um, which is how do libraries manage the risk of choosing an LLM and then not knowing if the standards of the model will continue in the long term and or if it's going to be kept up to date? My goodness, thank you. Whoever said that, that's an awesome question. I don't have answers for you, but that's an awesome question and we should ask more people that. <laughs> but really, I think that, um, yeah, when, when we're looking at what, it's changing so qu quickly. And, you know, I'll, I'll keep it short because I know I, I've talked a few times here um, ad nauseum, but it's about that transparency and keeping up with that transparency. There are tools out there um, that that monitor all of these different criteria of transparency and efficacy and um, when the, the models were updated, at what point in time were they updated? Because after that, everything is, if it's time series, it's definitely going to be a hallucination because it doesn't know any better. Um, these types of things are, are things that are KPIs, right? You should be monitoring these things for the models that you end up using, or if you're working with labs or students that are using um, AI and they're going to be using something that um, lasts for more than a year. These are some of the things that um, you want to get a tool or a process in place to continuously check these, these pieces of, of information so that you can then decide if you want to uh, swap out the model. The good thing is a lot of these models are self-contained. So you send a query in and you do things that connect into it. So swapping the the model out is actually not as complicated as maybe something that has to kind of uh, have tentacles all through your system. So that's one nice thing, I guess. One yeah. thing that I would add. Oh. Oh. Oh, go ahead, Michael. 
Yeah, I was just going to briefly say that very much aligns with DISC's advice. So we've got an AI maturity model. And as we move across to a point where AI is embedded, one of the core things we say is you must have mature governance processes to continually monitor your AI systems. And this is one of the things that's different between AI and traditional deterministic I IT. You know, your algorithm in traditional IT systems will always do the same thing for the same output. Your AI won't, so you need new process in place to continually monitor the effectiveness of the, the thing that you're doing. Yeah, to me, this um, uh, translates as like a question of uh, agency and where libraries are likely to have the most agency with respect to an LLM or a service or product that is developed on top of one. Um, I would argue that we likely have the most agency when we engage with open source solutions um, that are fully transparent. Um, there are trade-offs, right, where it may require more resourcing and expertise on our end to make full use of an open source solution. Um, but we have more control than we would um, as uh, a customer of a proprietary solution, um, I would argue. I will add a piece to that, though. So in the library space, we have very clear guidelines. We have Creative Commons. We have guidelines on what open means. The word is thrown all around a lot in the AI space with models, but they do not have the same or standardized ways of defining what is open and what is transparent. So just as a word of caution, when you are going into this, if you see that, it doesn't mean it's not, it means that you do need to do your due diligence because it's not gonna be standard if they all say the same thing. Make sure you do your, your homework and make sure that they truly are open. Um, and uh, yes, their, their definition of open is very different than the library space. And I uh, there's a lot of articles out there on this as well. So. Um, definitely read up on that because it's not as uh, straightforward as us in the library folks uh, have, have figured out over the years. Yeah, I, I'll add to that as well. I, I agree. Um, and uh, there's currently an international uh, effort at work to try and update the definition of open source um, so that there's common understanding there. I think that will be particularly useful because we see releases um, that come, say, from a company like Meta where with Llama, they were additionally referring to it as an open source uh, model, right? And uh, subsequently, I've seen that marketing sort of change <laughs> on the website because essentially the way it, it was open to some extent, but then with if you looked into the licensing and terms for Llama, it basically created a funnel where all community contributions or work with Llama could only basically channel back to the improvement of Llama. So you couldn't really fork off and reuse independently um, of Meta. Um, so when I said truly open source uh, in my comment, uh, I, I was doing a lot of, uh, uh, I don't know, investment of work that needs to happen still um, in the community. And that is happening. So. Yeah, and I think the whole concept of source doesn't translate terribly well to machine learning model. You can't inspect weights and understand what they mean in the same way you can computer code. So. Yeah, a complex space. For, we only have five minutes left. We do only have five minutes. I'm <laughs> thinking if you have one minute each, we can squeeze one more in. Shall we give it a go? Go on. So um, from Stuart, AI is good at recognizing patterns. It can gather data on people even without direct access to personal information. So how do we protect privacy with rapid evolution of generational AI in the era of large language models? Oh, one minute each on that. <laughs> Um, yeah, just maybe to start with, um, there are architectures that you can use to prevent data, for example, to be fed back into large language models for, for training or any of that sort of thing. Um, other, you know, if, if these environments are not available, uh, companies wouldn't use any generative AI. Um, that's just facts because we all have private data. We all have data that, that we cannot share and, and, and all of that. Um, so there are architectures to do that. Um, how safe they are. Again, you know, you have to do due diligence um, and check um, really to see what is being passed on, what's not being passed on. Um, yeah, so that that would be my suggestion here. Yeah, I think this is getting at the fact that the advertisers in particular have drawn lots of inferences about who we are, which are um, not because of our um, any data we put in, but the things we do, our behaviours and so on. Um, 
does large language models increase people's ability to do that? I, I don't know. I think that they were fantastic at doing it anyway. Um, so I think the only controls that are on this are legislative. I mean, I second a lot of the, the things that I already said here, but um, the other thing that is out there is um, personal knowledge graphs or pods, if you're if you're following what Tim Berners-Lee has now turned his hand to. Um, it's all about the control of your own data and how you can control it in your own little pod of information. And then you get to volunteer when things are shared and what information you want shared, because maybe you want your recommendation to be more personalized. Um, sounds a whole lot like something you need to worry about with GDPR. And there's a reason I say that because yes, you do, <laughs> right? Um, but it's it's also, you know, a lot of the data that is collected on on the open web on different interactions that you do, even if you're not logged in or anything, it is, as Michael said, it's your behaviors. Like they, they're they collecting like-minded like or like um, clicking people um, or or things because it could be an organization or something else and and deriving things from that. And so when they start to see that pattern with you, then they they start. So it, it maybe looks like it's tailored to you as an individual, but maybe it's not, but I completely understand. And we all have to really pay attention to those privacy things that are out there. And the good thing is the regulations and laws are, are getting there at least. So we have that going for us. I have maybe a boring response to this question which is it's in line with what we've had to do for some time, which is to be good about reviewing uh, terms and, uh, and, and licenses. Uh, we see this pop up in the news every once in a while when I think a recent one was like Slack or something. They had updated their terms where they were gonna start incorporating user data and people got pissed off about it and then they updated it or something. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a boring one. I think <laughs> you just need to, continue to be good about monitoring, you know, product uh, terms. For the efficiencies we talk about with AI, have it read all the, uh, all that, that correspondence and deep legal jargon to summarize oh. it for you. There you go. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> positive. I want to end on a positive. It's not all negative. <laughs> when I say boring, I mean that to be a comfort because it's something that we have a lot of experience in. Yeah, let's neatly turn that into a grand positive at the end there, Thomas, which is a really <laughs> great place uh, to finish. We are dead on.